I'm uh, Panish Puranam, and on behalf of the Organization Design Community, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on delving beneath the surface of non-hierarchical organization. Uh, a little bit about ODC for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, the org design community is basically a network of uh, practitioners and researchers who uh, have been in existence as this community for about a decade now. We'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary next year. And um, we're a pretty heterodox bunch of people with very different views on methods, research, data, practice, but we're all united by the ambition to improve the science of understanding how organizations work and the engineering of how to design them better. And the community has a number of initiatives. You might have heard of the Journal of Organizational Design, which is our flagship journal for the community. So Metin Sengul and John Joseph are the current chief editors and soon they are uh, going to be relieved by our next incoming editors, Oliver Bauman and Brian Boo. Uh, we have uh, an annual conference, which in 2021, very likely will be a virtual one and is going to be led by Toby Kretschmer and Gurnita Vasudeva. And the theme in 2021 is the design of meta organizations, platforms, communities, and ecosystems. Um, we also have webinars, which we are in right now. And I suspect the annual conference will also feel a bit like a webinar this year. We also have podcasts. We just completed a very successful series on making remote work. Um, and uh, we are about to transition to a new series on organizational resilience, which I strongly encourage you to take a look at. And we have teaching resources online within the community, which range from course materials, lecture notes, all the way to finding a network to access a guest speaker. And finally, in collaboration with the Organizational Design Forum and the European Organizational Design Forum, ODC is also involved in certifying organizational design professionals. So all in all, it's a very interesting, exciting community that I found to be a very nice home where I can meet uh, people interested in the research in organizational design but also in the practice and finding platforms where both types can be found easily and engage in an interesting conversation is not that easy. So I found it very fruitful. I hope you will consider joining as well if you haven't already. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Mike Lee, who will lead you on the rest of this journey today. Mike. Okay, great. Thank you, Finish. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um... Uh, okay, uh, so uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Lee. I'm a professor uh, of organizational behavior at INSEAD. And um, yeah, welcome. I'm really excited to have, um, I think, a great set of presentations, um, a great discussant, and um, a great topic. And, and really excited that there's a, a, a group of audience, uh, an audience to, to, to join and participate. Uh, and that we could make it available to the public. Um, so I'm just going to really quickly run through the kind of agenda and also some basic ground rules. Um, so we're going to start with the four research presentations uh, by Trevor, uh, starting with Trevor, uh, then I will be presenting, and then Ariana will be presenting, and then finally Hila and Sarah, or our co-author Sarah, will be presenting. Um, and we're going to have about 20 minutes per presentation, uh, which will be divided between the presentation and then Q&A. Uh, and then we're going to end with uh, both a uh, sort of a reflection from Stuart Bunderson about the presentations and also uh, more broadly about uh, the future of research in this area. And then we're going to try to open up a, a broader kind of discussion or at least some reflections around uh, the future of research on less hierarchical organizing. So that's the goal. I would say it's pretty ambitious. We have a lot to cover in 120 minutes. So um, try to be as efficient as possible. Uh, just some basic, I think, ground rules. Um, obviously, please stay muted unless you know, you're speaking uh, and, and asking a question. Um, I would say like, let's use the chat throughout. Um, you know, the beauty of, uh, of the virtual format is that we can sort of have parallel conversations. Uh, during the presentation, people can be sharing comments, asking questions, um, and I'll be monitoring the chat as well uh, so that, you know, we can kind of call questions even during the, that come up during the presentation and bring those, try to bring those out during the Q&A. Um, I would say, um, yeah, try to type your question into the chat box. So, you know, if there are similar questions by multiple people, then I can try to, to kind of synthesize and group those questions together so that we can try to get as many questions as possible. And also I'm gonna be trying to simultaneously sort of facilitate and keep the trains running while also presenting 
And so uh, I apologize in advance if, uh, if things go a little bit awry in that process, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Trevor for our first presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this group. Um, uh, it, yeah, you know, it's a topic that I'm really excited about, and I'm really happy that there's a community of people interested in this and doing work on it. Um, so, <clears throat> hopefully, you can now see my screen. So, um, the title of the paper is different from what you saw on Mike's slide. Uh, this is a work in progress. Um, and and um, so uh, I look forward to your feedback. Um, this is not a paper yet under review, and so uh, all feedback is welcome. Um, we're calling it a positive or zero-sum game, social and market outcomes of worker cooperatives in knowledge-intensive industries. And it's a collaboration with Natalie Mani from the University of Montpellier and Doug Cruz, two economists. Um, I'm in organizational behavior at the University of Pittsburgh with an affiliation in sociology. So this is really an interdisciplinary project. And I'll just say at the, at the start that um, I, I, I think that on the surface, to a certain degree, this is somewhat of an empirical uh, exercise, sort of the, the purpose of the paper. That, at, you know, on the surface of it, it doesn't seem to me that, it, that there's enormous theoretical development being done. Um, but as I was pre preparing the presentation, I think that there might be room for thinking more broadly about the theoretical relevance of it. Um, and so I would really welcome thoughts on sort of building out that part of the paper. Um, so let me get right into it. So this is a paper about workplace democracy, which we're going to define as a mode of economic organization that widely and evenly distributes ownership and governance rights among a plurality of workers. We can think about it as an extreme form of less hierarchical organization, where it's not only uh, autonomy over day-to-day -day work or um, uh, involvement in team decision making, but some authority over firm governance, uh, where the workers actually have ownership and governance rights. Um, the archetypal, archetypal form of workplace democracy is the worker cooperative, um, and it is a source of public policy interest, um, whether at the United Nations or in the U.S. Uh, Congress recently passed legislation to promote the growth of worker cooperatives, and a lot of the reasoning behind that is that this is thought of as an organizational form that has a number of positive externalities. Employment stability, reductions in intra-organizational inequality, even promotion of civic engagement. Workers are, uh, have been found to be more civically engaged uh, who work in cooperatives versus conventional firms. Um, and economic integration of marginalized groups. So a lot of positive social externalities, um, but the question has always been about their market viability. Um, they are extremely rare. Worker cooperatives are approximately 2% of firms globally, according to UNDP. Um, and, and prior explanations um, have suggested, well, maybe worker cooperatives just aren't trying to be profitable. That's just not their goal. Um, and so they don't survive in markets because they're not prioritizing that. Um, others have pointed to the internal coordination costs, having a whole bunch of people um, all involved in firm decision making is highly inefficient. Um, but there's pretty mixed empirical evidence of this. Um, and so I wanted to take sort of a different track and ask under what conditions is workplace democracy econo uh, economically viable? Uh, Eric Olin Wright, my advisor from, from grad school, referred to worker cooperatives as a real utopia. Um, but how real is this utopia? Um, so that's kind of the, the motivation of the paper. And second of all, if there are conditions under which this organizational form is viable in markets, does that compromise social benefits? Um, and there are a lot of implications of trade-offs between social and economic benefits. Um, that the cost of power equality, spreading power across the organization is going to be coordination costs. Um, the pursuit of worker wealth maximization will come at the cost of reinvestment in the firm. So all kinds of implications of trade-offs. And I think there's also a broader interest, and this is where I think this might speak to a wider audience, about organizational forms that combine social and market goals, right? Think about hybrid organizations, corporate social responsibility, social economies. There's an interest in whether these are trade-offs or whether 
you can do well by doing good as well. So under what conditions can workplace democracy achieve both social and market performance? This is not super theoretically novel. I'm basically going to argue that less hierarchical organizations thrive in more knowledge intensive contexts. Um, that's sort of the, the short of it. Um, that um, less hierarchical firms are able to draw knowledge from the ground up, um, that the workers doing the work right, have control over decisions related to sort of what needs to be done, um, and that this diminished hierarchy encourages knowledge exchange. You can think about Paul Adler's work on, on kind of network, trust-based form, community forms. You can think back to contingency theory. And then just sort of as suggestive evidence, you can think about all the professional service firms organized as partnerships, which are in essence worker cooperatives organizing uh, in these knowledge intensive industries. So, you know, I argue that the market performance of worker cooperatives will be greater in more knowledge intensive industries. But I think interestingly, we also have reason to think that these social benefits of worker cooperatives will also be greater in these knowledge intensive industries. This is drawing on relational theories of inequality, which suggest that the level of inequality within firms is a function of the bargaining power of the different groups. And then in knowledge intensive industries, we actually have greater inequality because you have more unequal bargaining power among that subset of knowledge workers uh, and, or among these capital holders, if it's more of a capital intensive type uh, knowledge industry and worker cooperatives distribute power. And so basically, if the starting point is higher, worker cooperatives have a greater sort of room to depress the level of inequality, right? It starts off higher knowledge intensive industries, they push it down. We're using tax data from France. Um, this is um, administrative data from the French government. Um, this is linked employer employee data, 10 years of it. Um, we are going to create two samples a matched sample of conventional firms and cooperatives that don't change organizational structure, and we're gonna create a matched sample of switchers, organizations that switch organizational structures, and we can, in, in essence, do a difference in difference type estimation. We're gonna use two measures of knowledge intensity, uh, percent uh, tertiary educated workers at the industry level, and R&D investment. So two measures of, uh, of knowledge intensity, for the non-switchers, we use a random effects model. For the switchers, we use a fixed effects model. The market performance model is a Cobb-Douglas production function where value added is the outcome. Uh, social performance model, we're gonna use um, uh, standard deviation, dispersion of annual income within the workplace because we have that individual worker level data as the outcome variable. And we're just going to interact the knowledge intensity of the industry and whether or not the firm is a cooperative. So to fast forward the results, I won't show you regression tables, I just show you uh, predicted value plots. Um, so <clears throat> in low knowledge, and so, so this is using the R&D knowledge intensity measure. Um, and in the non-switcher, you know, what we find is that sometimes it's that worker cooperatives underperform in low knowledge intensity industries, and sometimes they overperform in high knowledge intensity industries. Like the action is kind of sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other side. So in the non-switcher sample with the R&D knowledge intensity measure, right, it's that worker cooperatives underperform in low knowledge intensity, but there's no difference in high knowledge intensity. The confidence intervals are, are overlapping with the point estimates. But in the switcher sample, Right. This is the the approximating difference in difference. It's the uh, both underperforming in low knowledge intensity, overperforming in high knowledge intensity. We see a similar pattern of results with the education-based uh, knowledge intensity or innovation measure. Um, same sort of pattern thing. And then let me switch to um, you know getting kind of close to my time here. Uh, is there anything to to, to highlight here. I mean, the results are, are whether in, in the switcher sample or the non-switcher sample, the results are relatively um, uh, consistent. Um, switching to the social outcomes uh, question, we don't find a consistent result in the switcher sample, in the, the matched pairs with the firm switching organizational structures. We do find the result consistent with our 
expectations in the non-switcher sample. So the results are just not as robust. Um, but what's interesting is that consistent with sort of what I was suggesting before, the highest inequality, the highest intra-organizational income inequality is in the conventional firms in knowledge intensive industries where that subset of individuals have very strong bargaining power and they're able to pull more resources, more surplus towards themselves. And that's where you see that strong depressing effect of being a worker cooperative. So this evidence, though less robust, does seem to suggest that in knowledge intensive industries, you can achieve both social and, and, uh, and market benefits. So let me just conclude with, with several points. I mean, this paper is primarily engaging with the literature on workplace democracy. There hasn't been a ton of recent work in this space. It's been kind of dead for a while. And I think maybe one reason, because they're not engaging with the organizational theory literature. They're, I mean, there's this vast literature in, in org theory and organizational behavior about less hierarchical organizations, professional service firms that would all direct them towards knowledge intensive industries. And there just hasn't been that that attention to it. And when they ask about the rarity of it, well, if you consider professional service firms, partnerships to be a type of worker cooperative, well, actually there is greater prevalence, right, of it. They're not quite as underrepresented as we think. And if we think about more modest forms of workplace democracy, like the other types we're talking about today, those are also more prevalent and in knowledge intensive industries, right? So the finding is not so surprising, but maybe a useful contribution to the workplace democracy literature. And for the scholarship on social responsibility and social enterprise and, 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 and hybrid organizations, a lot of that research has talked about identity uh, and blending identities. Um, and this points to a more structural explanation of how one can achieve both social and market benefits. Instead of looking at one identity winning or, or even decoupling of identities, that's what some of this hybrids literature has looked at. Um, this suggests more of a structural explanation of when you're able to comply on social and market benefits. And then at a practical managerial level for, for people that, you know, advocating for workplace democracy, um, you know, whether at the United Nations or, or in uh, pub, you know, state, local government, um, think about knowledge intensity, right? Think about that as a fruitful space in which to be promoting workplace democracy as opposed to um, more routinized work. So uh, I'll leave it there and I look forward to questions and comments. Great, thank you, Trevor. Um, so yeah, if you, have, uh, for, if you have questions, feel free to just uh, type them in in chat. I mean, you don't have to type the entire question, but just maybe a, a snippet of, of it and then I can, uh, I can call on you. Maybe while we're waiting, I'll, I'll, Trevor, I'll ask you a question. So just so I, uh, I better understand, like you, you, you kind of looked at switchers and non-switchers. Um, and were the switchers all switching from traditional uh, sort of conventional structures to cooperative structures? And then it seemed like there were different, there was sort of more economic benefit for switchers, but less social benefit for switchers. Is that what you found? And, and can you talk a little bit about why we should expect different um, results for switchers versus non-switchers? So the switchers are firms that convert from being conventional firms to becoming work, you know, uh, democratic workplaces. <clears throat> and we match those firms with comparable firms who don't switch organizational structures. So we're essentially doing a pre-post comparison of the two and we match them on things that uh, you know, uh, might predict conversion, like for example, sales in the prior years or industry that they're in or location or um, <clears throat> number of other characteristics. We don't, I don't expect there to be, um, you know, for them to be, uh, for the results to be different in one sample versus the other. It's that they're both incomplete samples. They're both imperfect samples. The non-switcher sample is more representative of the population of firms. Um, 
but it's less precise because you don't actually see sort of the performance that you can't put in a firm fixed effects and control for those time invariant factors. And so it's just the idea is like if we can get results in both, then it's just a more robust result. Um, and we just don't get the same level of robustness with the social benefit result. That's, that's the short of it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have two questions, uh, Miriam and Naomi, that, that sort of ask, I think, similar questions around, um, around what motivated uh, the switching. I mean, do you have a sense of that? Um, like, do they drift into it and then they realize they were there? Like, do you have, a, do you have any, I know this is a kind of a, a, a quantitative data set, um, so you may not have sort of specific details, but, but any kind of, I think, color you can provide, uh, or is there any color you can provide on what's, what's kind of how, how these organizations decide to switch and what's really sparking that? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's pretty heterogeneous. Um, so the, the strongest predictor of switching from the data is the prior financial performance. Um, but that's not even such a strong predictor. I mean, it, it predicts about 10 to 15 percent of, of, the, of, of the likelihood of switching. But um, from sort of anecdotally, I mean, um, retirements of, of owners, um, that's sort of one driver of switching. Um, that's sort of a stronger, but we don't have that in the data set. Um, that's one that I would love to be able to, to include in there. But yeah, this is a challenge is that the decision to switch structures is a pretty unusual decision. I mean, it's, it's unusual enough to be a worker cooperative in the first place. It's even more unusual to switch organizational structures. Um, so this is a challenge. And this is why it seems important to have both the switchers and the non-switchers and be able to show the result in both contexts. Got it, okay. And Finish, uh, you asked a question. Do you wanna, do you wanna elaborate on that or do you, should I just, what, yeah, why don't you? I think it's very similar to Valerie's question. So if you could just tell us a bit yeah. about the internal structure of these entities in terms of layers, uh, centralization of decision-making, resource allocation, dispute resolution. Yeah, so uh, again, that's quite heterogeneous. So sometimes you have these elected bodies where you will have, you know, five people who serve as executives for a, a term. Um, sometimes you will have more collective decision making um, where you will literally, you know, if it's a smaller firm, if, you know, 20 people working in the company, you might have them all sitting in the boardroom once a month. I uh, did. Uh, ethnographic research at a firm that was 50, a si 50 people, and once a month they all sat in a boardroom uh, and they had an executive. So it's quite heterogeneous and you have some committee structures. So the degree of representativeness varies quite a bit in these firms. Great. And then I think uh, we have probably time for one more question. Um, so uh, Khalid asks just kind of how big were these organizations and maybe he yeah, asked specifically about the switchers but maybe there's a broader question around the sort of scale any scale limitations of uh, cooperatives uh in your sample like are they smaller bigger than the conventional firms um yeah and with that one so the average cooperative in france is larger than the average conventional firm um so there are very large cooperatives um, or, you know, uh, thousands of people. Um, there are small ones, but there are lots of small conventional firms as well. Um, among the switches, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I, I should look back and look at the size of those switchers um, and think about sort of that being a limitation, certainly, right, like might be a limitation on that finding on its own. <clears throat> but at the general level, right, they, they range quite a, a great deal in size. Um, there's a worker cooperative in, um, in, in northern Spain that has 60,000 members in it. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity.
um, and their decision-making structure is much more representative. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Trevor. Um, so there's a, there, it looks like there's, there's a lot of comments and questions. So, um, you know, I think that's great. And, and maybe during, uh, during the break or during, uh, uh, Trevor can, can respond, uh, or, or log some of these comments, uh, uh, so that, you know, he can, he can respond as he, uh, as he's able to. Um, but let's move to uh, the next presentation. And Trevor is actually going to sort of also facilitate the Q&A period for my presentation. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so this is a collaboration with uh, my co-author, Paul Green, uh, who's on the call, and he's a professor at UT Austin. And uh, also like Trevor's, this paper is, um, very much a work in progress. Um, and so we're still working through uh, some of our data analysis and, and theorizing. And so we're really looking forward to any kind of questions, feedback that, that, that you have to this. Um, so, you know, I think uh, part of what's motivated this, uh, this panel in general is just the notion that, you know, organizations are increasingly looking to flatten hierarchies and distribute power. And that there are sort of many trends driving this. One is just this kind of uh, desire to become more agile and startup-like, right? We're all living kind of in a startup economy these days with entrepreneurial firms disrupting and dominating, uh, you know, various industries. Um, there's an increasing interest in, I think, to, to Trevor's research in social inequality and the role that organizational hierarchy plays in driving social inequities. Um, and I think, uh, finally, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a trend towards uh, motivating and engaging employees. Um, you know, as uh, work and careers become a, a more central focus of meaning and fulfillment in people's lives, uh, there's increasing demands by workers for autonomy, for impact and influence in their work. And so that's really the focus of this paper is looking at you know, how do, um, how do decentralized or less hierarchical organizational structures affect uh, the, the sort of employee experience at work? And we focus specifically on decentralization of authority, which we define as uh, the shifting of authority downward from managers to workers, which allows individuals uh, to essentially uh, self-manage. Um, and uh, there is a, a lot of reasons, uh, theoretical reasons put forth for why decentralizing authority should lead to improved employee experience. Uh, we have self-determination theory, job characteristics theory, socio-technical systems theory that all sort of make uh, strong uh, hypotheses in these direction. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the results of the existing empirical studies on how structural decentralization impacts employee experience are relatively weak. They tend to show positive effects, but they're not very strong. And there's actually a fair number of studies that show mixed or even null effects on employee experience. And I think one of the reasons for this is that the existing research tends to assume homogeneous effects of decentralization across the population, or at least they're looking at average effects. But there's plenty of theoretical intuition that uh, suggests decentralizing authority has heterogeneous effects um, on individuals and on work experience. So we know that operating in a less hierarchical structures goes against sort of deeply ingrained and habitual ways of working and relating. Uh, like we all have grown up, you know, sort of develop our careers working in hierarchies. And so switching can become very challenging. And so some have suggested that actually operating in these types of more decentralized structures requires greater skill, maturity, psychological capacity, and training. Um, there's relatively little empirical evidence on this, but the one study that I want to point to is a study by Dennis Campbell, who found that employees recruited after a company adopted a decentralization initiative were more likely to exercise authority and actually to make good decisions with that authority than those that, that were hired before the change, suggesting right that there are these different uh, capacities uh, to, to self-manage. And so the focus of this research is really to look at what factors predict who thrives um, in these in decentralized structures. Um, and so the, the moderators that we propose are the following. One is job mastery. 
Um, and, and the reason why we think that this, uh, this moderates the relationship is that, you know, decentralized authority reduces managerial control and oversight and direction. Right. We know managers, uh, one of the primary roles is they, they help direct work, they provide coaching and support, and that, that by decentralizing authority, we will reduce the sort of managerial role in, in the day-to-day -day work of workers. And so that's going to require workers uh, to, to essentially uh, to, to guide the work themselves, which we think requires greater competence and mastery in their jobs. And so we expect that those with higher job mastery are more likely to thrive in a decentralized structure than those with low job mastery. We also think, propose that interest in self-managing should moderate the relationship between decentralization and work experience. And that's because um, you know, we know that some individuals actually express preferences for hierarchical supervision because of the structure and clarity it offers. And we know that operating in decentralized contexts tends to require a pretty big shift in behavior and also entails greater ambiguity and self-reliance. And so we expect that because of these changes and the challenges of operating in these environments that, um, that actually people who are interested, who have a high interest in, in, in self-managing are more likely to thrive in decentralized structures than those with low interest. And then finally, the third, uh, the, 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 the final moderator that we propose is psychological safety. So, you know, an enabling context for it matters for the success of self-management and many of the behaviors that are expected in a decentralized context, such as taking proactive action, uh, raising questions, are actually behaviors that are typically risky in a hierarchical context. And psychological safety, we know, is one of the primary factors that affects and enables greater risk taking in groups and is an important uh, factor in enabling successful change initiatives. So we expect that uh, individuals who experience high psychological safety are more likely to thrive in a decentralized structure than those with low psychological safety. So quickly on the method, we conducted a 12 month field experiment uh, where the treatment was the adoption of a decentralized authority structure that gave employees uh, formal authority to uh, make decisions related to their day-to-day -day work without needing managerial approval. And, um, and we conducted this in a state government agency and about half of the agency uh, opted into the experiment uh, and there were about 40 groups and we conducted surveys both before the intervention and then 12 months after. Uh, we also conducted interviews and we're still trying to figure out essentially uh, what we're going to do with that. Uh, so, so that's not going to be a feature of the presentation today. And just briefly on treatment assignment, um, we used the baseline survey to essentially ensure balance along uh, the DVs and the moderators uh, at, uh, at baseline. And also we ensured that groups that were linked in the organization structurally were, in, were, were assigned to the same condition to reduce spillover effects between condition. And so, uh, and then the measures we used, uh, so for employee experience, we operationalized that as employee empowerment, engagement, and job satisfaction. A job mastery was rated by supervisors. Essentially, it's a performance measure. Um, interest in self-management was self-rated. How much would they like to operate? In, in this case, uh, the system was uh, holacracy. Uh, and then we used uh, hierarchical uh, HLM regressions to account for uh, group level effects as well. And so, just at a high level, we did test the main effect of whether decentralization had an impact on improving employee work experience, and we found no main effect of decentralization. So this was a little bit surprising, but not inconsistent with the existing uh, body of evidence. Um, but we did, in the interviews, notice a great deal of variation at the individual level in how people experience this change. And so in our moderation analysis, so um, just to briefly uh, orient you, we controlled for baseline measures of the outcome when testing and predicting the 12 month uh, measure of each outcome. We included the condition dummy, we included each of the moderators as controls, and then we included the interaction effect of the focal moderator. And what this suggests here is that job mastery uh, uh, was significant, a significant moderator for each of the three employee experience outcomes. And in calculating the simple slopes, we found that uh, 
essentially both the high and low uh, uh, lines for high and low job mastery were significantly different from zero, meaning that uh, high performers did better in decentralization relative to hierarchy and low performers actually did worse in decentralization relative to hierarchy. Um, so we found that to be a particularly interesting finding. We get similar results for interest in self-management. Um, and then for psychological safety, uh, it was a, uh, the results were significant for engagement and job satisfaction, uh, but not for empowerment. So for two out of the three moderators, um, and uh, we get significant uh, sort of similar uh, pictures here. So just to briefly summarize, uh, that the results suggest that moving to a decentralized structure did not improve uh, employee experience for the average employee, but some employees did thrive while others struggled. And that uh, you know, the, the moderators that we proposed do help predict who thrived and who struggled in this new structure. And I think interestingly, we found that uh, actually shifting to a decentralized structure actually had a negative impact on employee work experience for some individuals. It wasn't just that some people did better and other people did better, but less so. We actually found that some people fared worse from an employee experience perspective. And I think the, the main theoretical contribution is that, uh, that theories proposing the benefits of these uh, decentralized structures, I think, fail to adequately account for the heterogeneous effects of these structures and the conditions that need to be in place for these structures to actually improve employee work experience. And the practical implications being that organizations really need to consider, you know, whether the right conditions, both the human capital conditions as well as the contextual group conditions are in place uh, in order for uh, decentralization to have its intended benefits on employee experience. So I th we think of this kind of soil metaphor of is the right soil in place for the seed of, of self-management to, to grow in a healthy way. So thank you. All right, so um, thanks, Mike. Let me uh, uh, get into some of the comments from the chat. Uh, there were a number of comments kind of related to um, ensuring effective implementation. Um, and so let me kind of bunch them together. Um, you know, how can we met, you know, kind of from a practitioner standpoint, how can we measure these characteristics of people or is it easy to measure? Do you think that there are easier ways to measure them to ensure effective implementation of something like holacracy? And related to kind of implementation, do you have any insights about um, what to do with those people who don't respond well? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. So, you know, I mean, I think that this was a fairly, it's, I would say in some ways it was a standard implementation. Um, of, of holacracy, but at the same time, it was also uh, affected by the fact that um, we were implementing this in part of the organization and not all of the organizations. So in some ways I view it as a kind of conservative test. So when we think about the main effect uh, analysis of whether this had an effect on employee work experience, I, you know, I view this as a somewhat conservative test because of the, the kind of compromised nature of the, of the intervention, but I think the moderation analysis um, uh, wouldn't be affected by, by that uh, so much. Um, I mean, I think for low, low, I mean, we're trying to get more at the mechanism. So what's actually going on with low performers versus high performers? Like what is it really that's causing them to, um, to, to not to sort of struggle in these new environments? Is it because, you know, with all of this autonomy that they've been given, that uh, they they just are struggling because they, you know they they need more direction and they're not getting it. Um, is it that they are sort of exercising autonomy and then actually receiving pushback from either managers or other team members because they're making bad decisions? Um, I mean, I think there's a variety of potential uh, kind of different paths uh, that would help explain. Uh, those results. And I mean, I think that's one of the things we're sort of trying to do next is to try to get underneath that, uh, that more. Um, just to synthesize another set of comments, and then I, I want to invite other people to say something. There have been another, a, a number of comments about kind of um, 
uh, I would say sort of coaching adoption. So it seemed like there are some people who immediately responded well to it and others who right, didn't. Um, could those who didn't respond as well, could they be coached or mentored, um, right, to, or might the sort of be benefits or the, um, uh, you know, sort of um, increasing comfort with it just come over a longer period of time? It might just take those employees longer to kind of get on board with it, and then ultimately the, perform the broad performance comes kind of later on. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think I have a, I don't have like a data-based answer for that, that second question, but I have a strong intuition, which is like, no, I don't think so. I, th I think that in general, like these effects tend to be seen pretty quickly and that if people don't see benefits pretty early on, they start to disengage. Um, that's so that that's kind of my intuition, but certainly it's sort of an open question. I mean, I think, I think that the question of like, can you train people, like what are the interventions that can help people uh, who wouldn't necessarily just thrive immediately or take to this like fish in water. Um, like what, what interventions could be used to actually help people adapt more effectively to a decentralized structure, I think is, is a great uh, question for future research. And it's actually, you know, to sort of, a, I think the end of our conversation is one of the thoughts I had or one of the things that I think uh, would be a great uh, kind of question ongoing an important ongoing question um, in this area. Uh, but I think the fact that there are some people who don't need, I mean, for organizations who are thinking about like practically, right? I mean, uh, th this type of intervention, this type of change is a huge investment for organizations, right? And entails a huge degree of change. And so I think expecting organizations to sort of invest in sort of ongoing deep training is just Un, is unlikely, right? It's unlikely, it's a little bit unrealistic. And so I think for most organizations looking to adopt these types of structures, we need to think more about like, okay, do we have the right people in the organization, right? Do we have the right conditions in place for, for people to thrive without needing to sort of also adopt, uh, you know, intensive training, whatever that training might be. Uh, our, so Clarify me, are, are other people able to ask questions directly verbally or, is, or are other people asking through the chat? Is everyone, should I, should I pass all the questions along or? I'm going to leave that to you, Trevor, if, if okay. you feel like. Um, I, there have been a number of questions about whether, um, uh, basically the nature of the task had any consequence. Um, was there any heterogeneity in the task type? Yeah. So, so luckily, I mean, this was an IT, sort of an IT, an agency that provided IT services to the rest of the state government. So while there was some variation in task internally, it was relatively homogeneous, right? Like everyone was, was involved in technical work in providing IT services. And so, um, so I think that that helps, uh, but no, we haven't found, I mean, I think that there's some additional analysis we can do, but but I think uh, overall we haven't found any differences by task type. But that is sort of the general context was this is, a, this is an IT agency in this, at the state government. There's, there seems to be a lot of support in the chat for the idea of making a serious investment, right? It's like, do it, do it seriously or don't do it at all. Um, uh, did you have any measurements of the work groups or only of the individuals? Uh, Jeff, uh, could you uh, elaborate measure like set, what kind measurements of what what kinds of outcomes? Uh, well, just uh, this is as an example. You measured the psychological safety uh, at an individual level, and uh, I often think of that as a as a function of the group, uh, not just the individuals with uh, within it. And so I'd expect there would be correlations both of psychological safety and mastery. Uh, going back to the impact of the existing uh, support structures in the group, whether that's peer to peer or from the uh, leadership. And that I would, exp and so my prediction would be that that, that would have an impact on outcomes. Uh, and I just wonder if you had any this sort of aggregate view of this, because all the data as I understood it was all at the individual level and ignored any sort of work group effects. But I'm just testing my assumption there from what you've uh, 
Please. Yeah, so just briefly, I mean, it's a great question. So psychological safety is normally operationalized, conceptualized as a group, um, group uh, variable as you, as you described. We did run the analysis uh, with psychological safety as a group, sort of aggregating it to the group level and didn't find a uh, significant interaction effect. I mean, part of the reason is that there was a great deal of variance within the teams uh, uh, on perceptions of psychological safety. And so we, we actually think theoretically what matters is actually how people perceive, like what pe individuals perceive this level of psychological safety to be. So if in a group you have one person with high perceived psychological safety, another person with low, for that person with high, you know, sort of uh, averaging it with the low person, I think doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, actually their, their perception is more related to how they're going to sort of behave in this environment than the average of that high person and the low person. And, and, and sort of similarly for the person who perceives low psychological safety. Um, and then also there's sort of sample size concerns. So, you know, we only had 39 groups in this. And so just from a statistical power perspective, like running a sort of additional kind of group level kind of analyses. I mean, we did, we did run HLM. So we are uh, sort of accounting for group uh, correlations, but, um, but we really focus more at the individual level. Okay, thanks. So I think I'm out of time, Trevor. But thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you for for for, for facilitating that. Um, so uh, so we're going to turn it now to uh, Ariana. Uh, so her and uh, Finish's uh, research on uh, on uh, normative control in these uh, less hierarchical structures. Thank you, Mike. Let me share my screen. All right. Thanks a lot for Mike for organizing it and thank you all for, for being here. My name is Arianna Marchetti and I'm an assistant professor in strategy and entrepreneurship at London Business School. Today I will be presenting this uh, piece with Panish, uh, Peering Through the Glass Door, the Cultural Attributes of Less Hierarchical Firms. So I think this definition of less hierarchical requires less push with this audience. But anyway, we study organizations of this sort that you see on this chart. And I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with at least a couple of those. And the very intuitive idea, despite I've realized that we kind of use different defini definitions of less hierarchical, is that these firms have uh, a reduced reliance on traditional uh, hierarchical and formal control compared to the regular organization we have in mind. So we will refer to these organizations in the paper as less hierarchical, LH. And the idea is that if they can reduce the amount of hierarchy and still achieve collaboration among people, how do they do so? So the specific questions we ask in this paper is about whether the organizational culture can act as an enabler within these less hierarchical organizations to achieve uh, collaboration and to get things done pretty much. And if we're able to actually observe some cultural differences between less hierarchical and traditional forms, where do this come from? Is there any mechanisms that we can point at? So uh, the problem is that these firms are rather special in the way they're organized, but also very hard to study. It's very hard to get data about them, to get inside these organizations and really understand how they get people together and how they function. So with this paper, we're really trying to tackle this problem. And uh, we're using, in fact, a pretty extensive external source of organizational descriptive text. I will talk a bit more about that in the empirics, but we rely on about 170,000 text reviews from uh, Glassdoor, a website where people write what they like and dislike about their organizations. And we apply machine learning tools to these text reviews to understand cultural properties of less hierarchical firms. We also use empirically a matching sample approach to identify comparable traditional firms and try to control for all the rest that we're not interested in pretty much. And uh, finally, we try to put our finger on the underlying mechanisms that might drive the formation of the different cultures that we observe between less hierarchical and traditional firms. So with this in mind, uh, I will give you a very quick overview of our theory. So, what we know from prior literature is that very broadly, hierarchy in a traditional interpretation, so formal authority and control and culture are kind of structurally equivalent uh, within organizations to achieve collaboration. 
In this paper, we take a specific stand and we want to be very precise about what we mean uh, with organizational culture. We'll talk uh, specifically about strong organizational culture. So a culture in which the members reach consensus on which attributes have a uh, greatest intensity to them. So basically it's a culture in which people consider the same and few cultural attributes as relevant to them in making sense of their organization. Building on extant literature, we know that a strong culture can enhance collaboration by uh, creating both coordination and cooperation benefits. On the coordination side, uh, generally when cultural attributes are task related, uh, it's possible in a strong culture for people to create common ground and therefore being better able at anticipating each other's actions and interacting in an effective way. While on the cooperation side, uh, being part of a strong culture generally creates uh, homophily and therefore people have uh, a better, higher incentives to bear with each other in a sense and uh, kind of like, uh, glitch like look over um, failures in collaboration. So the idea is that if strong cultures enable uh, collaboration and a culture is in a sense equivalent to uh, uh, traditional hierarchy to achieve collaboration, we uh, hypothesize that less hierarchical firms should have stronger cultures than traditional firms, all else being equal. Now, the question is, where do these cultures come from? And uh, with a couple of more hypotheses, we really try to understand a bit more about the mechanisms that might form these different cultures that we observe. So the idea is that uh, a cultural configuration we know from prior literature is generally achieved uh, with a couple of different processes that involve the organizational members. The first is sorting. So sorting on entry and on exit is pretty much hiring the right people and retaining the right people. So getting rid of the misfits in a sense. And the second is socialization. Once the members belong to the organization, letting them interact with one another and also across uh, layers to favor the formation of a culture, pretty much. So our next hypothesis is going to be on the effect of sorting. Uh, sorting is expected to enhance the employees' alignment with the organizational culture. So uh, having hypothesized that a less hierarchical firm should have a stronger culture than a traditional firm, we expect the sorting processes to, to be stronger in uh, less hierarchical than traditional firms. So uh, we expect that uh, at their point uh, of entry, so when they join the organization, when they're hired, the cultural alignment of employees to the organizational culture is greater in less hierarchical than traditional firms. And similarly, when people leave, so at exit, the, their cultural misfit should be uh, higher in less hierarchical than traditional firms. The second mechanism we explore, as I mentioned before, is the socialization. So we know from prior literature that socialization can happen, happen laterally, so with individuals interacting peer-to-peer, -peer, but also top-down with mentoring and training programs. And this is expected to increase the cultural strength uh, of, of the organization. So again, in this case, we should expect that socialization should be more at stake within less hierarchical than in traditional firms, if our first hypothesis is correct. Um, so we, we, we proxy it with tenure, we proxy the socialization uh, process with the employee's tenure, and we argue with our last hypothesis that the cultural alignment of employees uh, to the organizational culture should increase with tenure at a faster rate within less hierarchical than traditional firms. So having this set of hypotheses in mind, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about how we measure organizational culture. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we rely on Glassdoor text reviews and we infer uh, cultural content from that and the extent to which people form a strong culture using topic modeling techniques. So let me give you, give you a quick review about how a review is created on Glassdoor and how this is used to uh, infer culture with our uh, empirical approach. A person goes online uh, and decides to write a review about their employer. So this person is gonna ask themselves, first of all, which are the attributes of the organization that really matters to them and they want to share on this platform with others. And once this choice has been made, uh, which are the words that they want to use to talk about every topic? So at that point, we will have the review online. What we do is for every organization, we feed uh, all the reviews available on Glassdoor to uh, a latent Dirichlet allocation uh, algorithm for topic modeling, which screens all these reviews and does two things. 
The first is to identify topics that people are talking about in their reviews. So topics are lists of words that statistically tend to occur together across the reviews. And in our understanding, those are the underlying cultural attributes that people are mentioning on Glassdoor when talking about their organizations. And the second output from the algorithm, which is really what we rely upon to measure cultural strengths, is for every review, a distri probability distribution over the topics that are discovered in the corpus. And this really tells us whether a person is talking about a lot of topics, is very focused on a few topics, and so on. So by comparing these distributions, we can get at whether the people uh, form a strong culture by talking about the same and few cultural topics on Glassdoor. So this is very quickly about our measure. Um, I want to show you the results before the results, how we build the sample. So uh, the main problem, as you might have imagined, is how we get at a sample of less hierarchical firms. Of course, there is no place like CompuStat where we can go and figure out which firms are these. So what we did is to start by screening all the academic uh, and specialized sources to identify these less hierarchical firms and then build uh, a match sample of traditional firms. We started by identifying all the competitors of the less hierarchical firms we could find in the first uh, stage. Those are listed on Glassdoor, so it was a relatively easy task. And then we only retaining, retained the best matching traditional firm based on age, size, revenue, industry, country, and ownership to be able to control as much as possible for variations across the two groups. This funneling approach left us with 46 less hierarchical and 48 traditional firms and a total of 170,000 Glassdoor reviews. And now the results. So H1 is really about understanding whether there exist the cultural differences across the two groups. So uh, let's focus in, on sample one. If there is time, I'll explain why we do sample two. Uh, what I'm showing here is that the cultural strength computed on the Glassdoor text reviews is higher for less hierarchical than traditional firms, which is in line with uh, our first hypothesis. So, so far we have established somehow that there exists a difference between the culture of these two groups, controlling for as much as we can in terms of differences between less hierarchical and traditional firms. Now we get to the mechanisms. The first one is about sorting on entry and on exit. So for sorting on entry, which is on hiring, we looked at people with low tenure, and uh, we proxy their fit by looking at the satisfaction rating that they report with their company when posting a review on Glassdoor. So we don't only have the text, but also a numerical rating about how satisfied they are with the organization. And we find that uh, low tenure people are more satisfied at entry in less hierarchical than traditional firms, consistent with our uh, second hypothesis. So it seems to be sorting at entry is at stake with uh, more strongly in less hierarchical than traditional firms. But we don't find support for sorting on exit. When we look only at former employees, employees that have left the organization, we would have expected to find uh, people being less, much, much strongly less satisfied in less hierarchical than traditional firms, but we don't find any statistical significance evidence of differences across the two groups. So in terms of sorting, it seems that sorting on exit is the really strong mechanism at stake here in forming, forming these cultural differences. Now, the second mechanism is socialization. And as I mentioned, we look at this by analyzing uh, the evolution of uh, employees' feet with their tenure. And uh, our hypothesis was that we should observe a faster increase of satisfaction uh, of employees with their tenure in less hierarchical than traditional firms. But again, we don't find support for that. Actually, it seems to be in the opposite direction. So it seems that socialization is really not the strong mechanism at stake here. To summarize our finding, we are observing that Comparing similar firms, less hierarchical companies exhibit stronger cultures than traditional ones. And these seem to be driven mostly by sorting in the right cultural feeds at hiring rather than retaining the, the good ones or socializing them when they are already part of the organization. 
To put it together with this paper, we are aiming at contributing to the literature on org design, uh, mostly, by showing that organizational culture is relevant to the emergence of organizational forms, and by providing an empirical proof of cultural differences uh, existing between less hierarchical and traditional forms, while extant literature has been mostly like theorizing about that. Um, we show something that I guess is a bit depressing for practitioners. Uh, it's a selection rather than training story. So if uh, a practitioner wants to change the culture of a group, it's really hard to achieve that through retention or socialization. They kind of need to change the people that are within the organization, at least to a certain extent. But we think this is a rather powerful result we're getting here. And finally, we provide a first large scale qualitative study of new organizational forms to our knowledge, despite all the issue of identifying them, pretty much. And uh, this is it from my side. I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ariana. Um, so I'm gonna start with Trevor. Yeah, I, so I, I, have a, I have a sort of a conceptual question. Um, I, I really enjoyed this, pro, this project and part of the reason is because it connects to a literature that I've been thinking about for a while in this area, which is around the is, issue of interest heterogeneity. So um, this great book by Henry Hansman called The Ownership of Enterprise. Um, in the 90s, he, you know, he, he's an economist and he basically makes the argument that the big challenge for less hierarchical organizations is coordination among heterogeneous interests. And so the solution is interest homogeneity. So why is it that we see um, you know, partnerships in professional services? Well, because it's a bunch of old white men uh, who are all professional occupations. So I guess what I'm wondering is, um, is this culture or is this interest homogeneity? Um, and maybe, maybe it is culture, but I think that that's an important thing to disentangle um, and could be potentially a contribution to, to that, that, liter that literature as well. So this is a, a very good point. And uh, I guess Panish and I over time have converged towards a very imperialistic view of culture. So for us, pretty much everything is culture, right? So in a sense, we try to do a bunch of things empirically to show that the topics we identify on the Glassdoor reviews speak to some level to culture. And the other is that we think of culture very much in line with the Shines approach. So I guess many people think of culture in a rather narrow way, thinking that culture is only the norms and values. While we also, incorporate what we call, uh, Shines called the artifacts, mostly like symbols, uh, the, the interests in a sense that are a representation, the ultimate representation, what you observe of the underlying norms and values that are shared. So this is the stand we take. Um, it's, it's a bit hard to push through because everyone seems to have a pretty strong view on culture is. We try to do as much as possible to show that at least a large part of our topics empirically map into values and norms, but we also want to pass the message that the symbols and the artifacts that we observe, the fact that a company is more prone to work on open space and things like that, those are artifacts of certain underlying cultural values. Of course, it would be very interesting to have a mapping between these higher level values and norms and how those get translated into symbols and practices. So it's a, it's a very good point and our reviewers are with you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, uh, I'm gonna go to uh, Jose. Jose, are you there? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, oh. I just had a question regarding the, like the fact that lesser hierarchical organizations have a stronger culture. And then I had a, the point was whether they would be using uh, consensus-based hiring procedures more often than in traditional co companies, because that way, like each member that is hiring, then they have a veto power for the, the new people that are going to be hired. That might be a mechanism. It could also be that the culture is so strong that there is not even need for a veto power, right? I mean, the people hiring have kind of clear in mind what the culture of the company is. They are good fit for this company. And so when they interview someone else, it becomes very evident if this person is gonna be a cultural misfit. So I think both stories could go and I don't think we have a way to, to tease it out. My sense is, 
that in a sense they go hand in hand because if this culture is so strong that is very salient to everyone probably what you're saying is, is true but there is not even need for for veto it's just people are very homogenous and so they tend to converge on similar candidates when they hire if that makes sense thanks Jose. thanks so i'm gonna jump in with a question here too which is that like you know i, I kind of wonder if like I'm, I'm curious why you expect uh, culture at like the cultural values at exit to be like more disjointed in less hierarchical firms because you know my, my sort of intuition is that like values tend to be more static right personal values tend to be more static and so I would expect actually that like in less hierarchical firms that the egg with one that uh, exit might be less frequent I don't think you you actually can capture that but like that there would be less sort of greater retention but that those who leave are leaving for kind of non-cultural reasons, right? It could be, uh, you know, the pay, it could be just sort of like other opportunities, but not really about sort of job satisfaction or values alignment. I'd be curious to get your reaction to that. So that's an interesting point. So what we're trying to, to, to do here is to say, okay, so sorting has to be working better in these uh, less hierarchical firms than in traditional ones for these strong cultures to be true, right? But in fact, our, and we, we uh, split it in sorting on entry and sorting on exit. Uh, however, our results seem to point more on your, in your direction. Our thinking was that if you manage as an employee to fall through the crack of the hiring in a, in a less hierarchical firm, and you're actually a misfit, the cost of misfit is, of misfitting is higher in uh, less hierarchical firms because of their stronger cultures. Because uh, in a sense, it's easier to live uh, and to be kind of okay in a weak culture where some cultural values and norms are not so strong and so strongly enforced. So that's our, our thinking, but it's, it's very interesting. I mean, in a sense, our results go in the direction of what you're saying. They leave because they were properly hired, but then something else happened and they, and they need to change job. I don't know. Our thinking was mostly that the cost of misfitting is higher in stronger cultures, because if you don't fit, there is no way you're right. going to fit in pretty much. But Have you looked at demographics of these two groups of firms? Because I would imagine just based on the names, I'm seeing that maybe the, the, the less hierarchical ones have many more younger employees that have less loyalty, whatever like we're seeing that the average tenure at Facebook is something like two years or, or in many of these tech firms. So I wonder if you were to compare them to the more hierarchical ones you have just in general, people stick longer in those firms or the type of people that are attracted to group A versus group B may be different. So we could certainly try to do that. The reason why we haven't really built a lot on this data is because uh, demographics information is voluntary when people fill in a review on Glassdoor. And so it's kind of like not very consistent. We have a lot of missing data. We would have gender, we would have the age group and education, which we could explore, but it's not a piece of information that we have broadly available for, for everyone. But for sure, I think in our maybe discuss section, we can discussion section, we can try to incorporate a bit more on the, on this like summary statistics very broadly. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Ariana, just for time's sake, we're going to keep going. Uh, but there are thank some really much. interesting questions in the chat. Uh, one from Jeffrey about, right, like uh, the kind of cultural fit and, and sort of diversity. Um, uh, and there's questions about, you know, whether culture is manageable. So I think that there's some really interesting questions there. So hopefully uh, uh, it'll be a Thank chance you. to respond to those. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's move to our final research presentation, uh, Hila and Sarah's. Great. Thank you, Mike. So it's great that you gathered such an interesting group uh, of studies kind of method-wise. I also yeah. noticed where we have field experiment and survey and this, and, and we're going to share with you our field study that we've been conducting uh, around accelerating innovation. So how can we accelerate innovation without killing it in hackathons, which are the new way of organizing, the less hierarchical way of organizing for innovation. So what are hackathons? I assume most of you have either heard of been or participated in one of them. There are, if we call this less hierarchical organization, um, they are the one way that organizations have been increasingly adopting that indeed 
believes in the lack of hierarchy, that hierarchy goes against creativity, against autonomy, against uh, curiosity. So it's open voluntary processes with, where individuals self-select into projects and teams. They organize ad hoc teaming uh, in the Edmondson uh, research. And there is no process or role definition. You don't get to be a leader or the designer. People show up in some of those uh, events. They don't even have name tags. The aspect that we will be focusing and we focused our research is on the time pressure because you take this uh, kind of, let's say, chaotic way of organizing and you add to the time pressure. What happens then? So what we know from the existing literature is that we would predict the time pressure would kill the creativity. Intense time pressure creates these vicious cycles of time famine and cognitive closure. Uh, and the second thing that we know is that the coordination between the team members will be very hard. So how can you coordinate with people that you just met on a new task that is creative? So there are two important challenging questions for the team when, when they meet up and we were participant observing in those teams. So what are we going to develop? These are new product development teams that have 72 hours to develop a new product. And how are we going to develop it and work together as a team? What we know from studies of ad hoc teaming is that usually it works well when there is some type of knowledge about the roles, about the structures, let's say in emergency rooms, uh, in disaster relief teams. But here when people come together, they don't have a shared knowledge of this type of a routine. So it creates this added ambiguity, uh, both on the, temp on the time dimension, temporal ambiguity, what should we do first, and then the ambiguity that is always with innovation, like what should we build? So this ambiguity creates interesting conditions. So I'll hand it over to Sarah to talk about the setting of the study. Right, so we observed, even though the literature would suggest that this is a really difficult thing, we see out of hackathons, many new products do get created and really innovative solutions to very challenging problems do come out of these. So we decided to study the context of hackathons in the US and we did this through this uh, hour by hour participant observation field study design, which I'll share here. We started first by studying hackathons in general. We uh, participated in and interviewed participants at over a dozen different hackathons across the US in different industries in healthcare, environmental, sustainability, um, many industries, fintech. And we realized that they're very chaotic, they're very diverse. And to get a really solid research design, we focused on two specific hackathons that are uh, designing healthcare solutions. They're assistive technology hackathons. And we focused our analysis and, and data collection around 13 projects. And all of these projects had very similar conditions at the start of their work process. And they had similar um, time constraints. They all had 72 hours to complete their challenge. They were given similar levels of difficulty of challenges, similar nature of challenges. They had similar access to technology, um, similar style of ad hoc teaming, and this self-selected lack of structure across all 13 projects. And what we were able to do is study their, their work process in this really detailed way to understand how were they working together. And at the end of the 72 hours, we had a clear comparable outcome which we used to differentiate teams that had successful working products at the end or teams that failed to deliver a working product at the end of the at the end of the 72 hours and so like you said we, we participated with these teams we collected data in this detailed observational hour by hour tracking method it was really difficult to keep up which we learned early on so for this uh, focus study we also used videos and photographs to understand their product development process more detailed. We conducted interviews throughout the process and afterwards, and we really studied what work artifacts they produced along the way to understand how they were working together and what differentiated the successful or the less successful uh, projects process. So I'll share with you, when we observed and analyzed the, the teams that were not successful, we observed two common areas of, of, of mistakes, of pitfalls. One is around how they dealt with time pressure. In these 
projects that, that failed, they, they felt this intense time pressure and their response to it was to bring process, bring structures that are familiar to them from their regular innovation work or from other experiences they've had in the past, bring these pro structures to this environment and move through them faster. So to adapt and compress their old ways of working to fit this new uh, intense limited time pressure. And the second was around team coordination. So these projects responded to the, the, this ad hoc lack of structure by doing what we teach in business schools and, and really bringing sort of best practices in, an, in other conditions. And they worked with this full clear coordination. So they wanted to build that shared understanding, what we described in the, in the previous presentations. They wanted to get on the same page. They clearly defined their task up front. They wanted details to be defined so that they could work together. They understood who was working on what. They had this division of labor. And they, they felt like these teams, when we were watching, we thought these teams were solid. These teams were going to really nail it. They're really organized. Um, this quote describes, describes this. One of the participants says, I think that those methods, Agile and Scrum, are really good frameworks for a team. So speed that up in a hackathon, that once a day, every day meeting. We do that every two hours, maybe, or something like that. We have to take time to do it. What happened was, under these conditions, in the really counterintuitive way, these behaviors, these patterns, actually led these teams to not have enough flexibility and to not have enough, uh, it was really too costly to, to work in this way under these conditions. And that these teams ultimately were extremely frustrated by the end and failed to, to deliver a working product. But there's good news, so we'll share with you, Hila, we'll describe the process of the teams that succeeded. So indeed, as Sarah described, the teams that we watched that failed are common failures that we've seen ever since we've been on many COVID remote hackathons and we've seen them over and over again. So I would say that this is uh, exactly that what we all want to do when we're under pressure with people that we just met. We want to organize things, and that's exactly what we should not do. So that's the number one thing if you take from this study, is to let go of those previous perfect team coordination when you're under uh, ambiguity and extreme time pressure. What are the good news? So the two things that did help the teams that, and by the way, there were six of those teams. So out of 13, six teams under 72 hours were able to produce and deliver to a user, a working prototype of an assistive device. So that was pretty amazing for us to watch. So what, what was their secret sauce? So the first thing is that letting go, that they did not try to compress the regular process. They assumed this is something completely different. And this is something that we see now a lot with the COVID hackathons, that people realize that sometimes new conditions really require a new process. So that understanding made a difference, we believe. And the second thing is that they did not try to fully coordinate. So unlike what we usually teach and recommend to have, uh, to create this shared knowledge and really clear coordination of who does what, these teams did not do that. What did they do instead? We call it minimal and adaptive coordination. What does it mean? So minimal means that they only agreed about the rough direction, overall high level solution. What is the rough idea that we're about to build? And then they quickly jumped into start, starting to experiment. So it only took them an hour uh, even to discuss these things. Unlike teams that discussed and got to real specifics as you saw before and measurements, these, these, these teams just said more or less. And we give you the analogy of sailing, that this felt like a stormy weather and some teams that tried to do kind of clear understanding and the full coordination, these we call kind of core setting, but those teams that did not, the minimal and adaptive, were tacking, were feeling the wind, sensing it and adapting accordingly. They did not know what's going to be at the end of the product, but we said more or less, and then split into sub teams or individuals that started experimenting. So experimenting under pressure, which was pretty impressive to see. So we said, we need to solve this problem, but how we get there, we don't know. And what is the adaptive part? That's the sensing, that's the tacking, that quickly they checked with each other after a few hours and they avoid the deep discussions or trying to convince each other what is the right way, but they check that the other person, what they were doing fits to what they're doing. If not, they quickly course correct it. They quickly change what they're doing. And they talk to each other. If someone wanted to start a long discussion, try to convince it, they don't spend too much time. Don't get caught up in the prettiness of it. You know, if you're trying to build a device and it was too aesthetic, we don't have time for that. Let's move on. So quick nudges, quick, uh, quick shifts that they helped each other. 
So basically, it was the opposite of the traditional coordination where we start very coordinated and slowly maybe we divide the work here. They started hardly coordinated and then co closely, gradually, they started developing a coordination. So by the end of it, we saw coordination, but throughout three days when they were working together, the feeling was that this is a very messy and very hard process to understand who's doing what, what's going on. There were a lot of mistakes, but they really embraced the ambiguity and the chaos. So when we talk to teams uh, these days, uh, when they're trying to build new products uh, under time pressure, as we are experiencing in this crisis, we are trying to talk about how can they embrace this ambiguity and the chaos instead of trying to fight it and to bring order to it. So we try to suggest that based on this study, we need to start with the chaos and the ambiguity and slowly clarity will come through the teamwork, but not to try to see the clarity to begin with, because sometimes the ambiguity goes up this threshold to an extent that you cannot actually see clearly in the beginning of your teamwork. So that, these are the main uh, conclusions. Uh, from our study uh, and if you have any questions and I see a lot of interesting comments around Agile and the comparison to Agile, uh, I would love uh, to take and open the floor for it. And the paper is now uh, in press at AMJ, so it's just uh, released now. Uh, so feel free to give us comments also afterwards. Um, okay, great. Thank you, Ila. Uh, yeah, you were mentioning about, so there are several comments. Uh, from Jeffrey and Kevin. Um, Kevin, do you want to you want to chime in here with uh, any specific question or maybe just a comment? Well, well I, I w let me start with a brief comment, and then people can jump in and shout. Um, the the minimum, minimal and adaptable coordination, as as described, well, to me, it's actually what Agile is all about. Uh, the 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 strict process framework, as described in Scrum. Well, that's not what Agile is. Uh, adhering to that and not uh, focusing on a con context-specific implementation of what is needed, that's not Agile. Agile means adapting to the situation, uh, to me. So minimal adaptable, uh, minimum and adaptable coordination, that's Agile, period. I'm happy that, that you feel so. So we talked to a few kind of Agile experts as well to try to understand the differences. What they told us is that Agile, uh, so far, the literature at least has focused more on the product that needs to be kind of, you know, how do you do it and less on the process. But if that's what you experience, I'm happy to, to hear it. I can share with you that we had engineers uh, and software uh, programmers that thought they were doing Agile also in the full coordination teams that failed. So I think Agile, you know, means so many things over time for so many different people, but I'm really happy to hear that that's how you see people really enact Agile. I think that's, uh, you know, such a, uh, there's so, there so many research opportunities around Agile and Scrum. I think these are very popular methods that we don't fully understand today. Uh, I think there's a, a problem of, of, of labeling and you'd have to divide, people use the word Agile and the difference between uh, the, the idea of cargo called Agile. I'm following the best practices that I read somewhere yeah. uh, versus people who understand the heart of it. And so uh, one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto Alistair Coburn, he said, you know, when you have an idea, you only have two choices. It will be misunderstood or ignored. Uh, and it's much better to have it be misunderstood. And I think it's the case with uh, many of the agile adoptions as they're trying to do it in a, as though it was a, a cookbook process. And any, any research, I think you're, you're, you've done a good example of how you could sample a group uh, and look at what they're doing to say, are they approaching agile in a adaptive way? Uh, as though you know, it's a it's a a, a, compl a complex problem that they need to uh, adapt to, or are they taking a best practices approach, um, and uh, which is uh, will we'll, uh, may, may, will bring some improvements uh, because there are some practices uh, that are, that will make improvements that are measurable, but it won't give you the essence of what you're looking for with that sort of adaptability and and flexibility. I'm happy that this is recorded. I will quote you next time that I get asked about Agile. Like, <laughs> Like really, that, that is like the heart of Agile versus the popular best practice version that people teach out there and the organization. And, and Elster Coburn has his, his branding these days is heart of Agile. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, okay, good to know. <laughs> and maybe to build on that, that uh, the role of the product owner in Agile it becomes really important then because if they don't understand their role, a lot of the, the rest sort of say doesn't work because they, they kind of like, they, 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 in that sense, they need to own it as well. And, and also a lot of the adaption kind of like also comes from them. 
So it's really good to actually look at, okay, like how are their practices actually changing from whatever other job they had beforehand? Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is, and that's what we try, by the way, to check whether this can be explained by the prior experience of participants, and it, it couldn't. But I would say, you know, we need maybe a, a huge sample in order to know it for sure. Uh, but it is very interesting uh, to think of what do you, are you, how able are you to disconnect from what you learned and those best practices when you're under new conditions. There is something I think, and maybe those studies before me that talked about the ability to be more uh, open to new experiences, to ambiguity, to less hierarchy, to kind of different situations can help explain that on the micro, on the individual level. Because we couldn't see any explanation on the like regular job type, gender, you know, age, all of those. Yeah, did you did you see any differences in um, the emergence of leaders in the two different groups? So it's interesting, um, because these were in maker spaces that are very against, I would say, leadership. Uh, people were afraid to take leadership. So in the interviews afterwards, some of those people felt. And they shared with us that they wanted maybe to say we should do this or that, but they felt they need to get to an agreement. And that's the mistake basically of the full coordination. And the teams that did not, there was no clear leadership. It was distributed leadership, but people just like split and then re like rejoined and then split and rejoined. And, and there were also a few teams in the paper with detail that remained split and had like three different prototypes. They could not join and it was simpler. The, the results were not as good as the kind of the minimal and adaptive that we recommend. These teams just remained minimal. They didn't do the adaptive part of Agile that we talk about. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think the tolerance for ambiguity, Jeffrey, you are mentioning that in the chat. And I was just emailing uh, my psychology uh, friend that studies uh, creativity in team. Uh, if she knows any of those surveys or scales that have been adopted that are useful to actually try with teams. So if anyone knows any research that you feel that is really, you know, useful to get from individuals, maybe like a survey or, or a, a demo test or something that people can do before they join a team and then even have a small discussion about their comfort level with ambiguity and uncertainty. Because I really feel in this crisis, we are all facing it on a, on, a, on a personal level. How comfortable we are with this constant change of our life, or our conditions, of our work. So there is something more uh, interesting, I think, to do that. So I'm exactly looking into it uh, right now from a research perspective to understand it and how can we use it for teams. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the micro researchers in the room might might know this more more in more detail, but there are like scales around need for control and, and need for certainty um, mm -hmm. that get at the opposite of the tolerance for ambiguity. Exactly. So, so. I thought the key, uh, sweet manipulation could be to give people in the beginning before they go into the hackathon or to a new product design ta uh, team and a task to give them this and then to share with each other to say, oh, I see that I have this, you know, high need. And then how can we do it? What should we do it about as a team? Because we cannot work, there's not going to be control, there's not going to be certainty here. These are uncertain conditions. So maybe sharing it. So that's one of the ideas we are entertaining. So I'm open to ideas about it. If anyone has ever tried it in their organizations or with teams, in a lab, in a real organization, I think that would be really neat. Because that's what people like now are asking me in these hackathons, what should we do about it? Is there a way to manipulate? Is there a way to intervene? To make people more open and embracing ambiguity in this uh, situation. Great. Uh, well, uh, we're at time, so thank you so much, uh, Hila and Sarah, and also the, the great uh, conversation and questions uh, afterwards. Um, so uh, that does it for the four research presentations. And now uh, I'm going to invite uh, Stuart Bunderson, uh, professor at uh, the Washington uh, uh, University of St. Louis Olin School of Business, uh, an um, expert on hierarchy and research on hierarchy to um, just provide some reflections on the presentations and then um, also to share just uh, maybe some thoughts around kind of uh, you know higher level broader kind of focus uh, of research in this in this general area i'm sure over to you Stuart. thanks mike so um i put together a couple of slides just to help organize my thought but um uh, this, this has been a really fascinating set of papers. Uh, really, f first thing I would say is just kudos to everybody for putting together really nice, thoughtful, uh, rich papers that are um, 
well executed and that have identified interesting contexts. Uh, the, the question we're trying to understand here is under what conditions is less hierarchical organizing more or less effective? And each of these papers really kind of grabbed onto that and I think did a nice job of um, giving us a perspective on that, on that, uh, on that question. So uh, Lee and M Mike and, and Paul, um, their answer is that, you know, uh, less hierarchical organizing is more effective when people are competent and self-directed and feel safe. And this, I mean, I, I loved this uh, field experiment that they were able to, to develop in uh, really kind of a, uh, a cool way of, of approaching this to sort of randomly assign people to these conditions and, and see, what, see what you get. Um, Trevor and his team, uh, their answer is, well, when tasks are more information intensive, and this is something that has come up a lot in research on hierarchy, that complexity and interdependence uh, of, of work lead to uh, questions about the effectiveness of hierarchy. And I, I love their, their sample as well, and looking at sort of workplace democracies and the conditions under which they're more effective was a, was a, was a nice approach. Um, Marchetti and Purnam, I thought there's the, the, their focus on uh, strong cultures, sort of basically going back to the, you know, how do we organize? Is it markets? Is it hierarchies? Is it or bureaucracies? Is it clans? And they're sort of looking at the clans and, and finding with a really cool and creative uh, approach, looking at glass door data that, um, you know, when cultures are strong and focused, you actually, you actually see that uh, correlated with uh, less hierarchical organizations. And finally, Gila and team, this uh, paper we just looked at, uh, their answer is that you know, when projects are operating under an accelerated and uncertain timeline, then you really need to uh, adopt less hierarchical organizing and that's gonna lead to, to greater effectiveness. So really just, I guess, first thing I would say is kudos to this team and, and to Mike for putting together a great set of papers uh, that uh, helps us to grapple with this. But I'd like to, as Mike said, in addition to sort of my, my general reactions, I, I'd like to kind of dig a little bit beneath the surface of this question and, and maybe invite us to think a little, more, uh, a, little, a little more broadly about the problem and then I'll return to some of these papers uh, after doing that. So let's think for just a minute about the problem we're trying to understand here. Um, the problem of hierarchy, obviously we, we can't think about hierarchy without thinking of Weber. And hierarchy is, uh, you know, what is it? It's one characteristic of bureaucracy, along with other characteristics that we typically look at, like specialization, standardization, and formalization. Formal hierarchy, unlike some of the other dimensions of bureaucracy, and it's important to keep those uh, separate, formal hierarchy is about the nested allocation of rational legal authority across positions or departments. Um, that's the formal side of hierarchy. It's the nested allocation of rational legal authority across positions or departments. So in other words, it's one part of what Weber identified as a constellation of stuff that explains what a bureaucracy is. So it's also important, I think, in going back to those origins to think about what hi hierarchy is not. Hierarchy is not the same thing as bureaucracy. And we have to be clear about that. I and mean, when you talk about rules and, and um, uh, formalization, you talk about standardization and specialization, those are separate elements of bureaucracy. It's not all, we, we shouldn't throw them all together into one bucket. Um, if, if we want to talk about bureaucracy, let's talk about bureaucracy. But if we're talking about hierarchy, let's be clear that hierarchy is not the same thing as bureaucracy. Secondly, hierarchy is not always based on rational legal authority. You could have hierarchies that are based on any number of other elements, including things like fear or respect or, or deference. And, um, and I'll get into that in just a minute. And then thirdly, hierarchy is not just found in formal organizational structures. So um, formal organizational structures can formalize rational legal authority and create hierarchies but that's not the only way to get a hierarchy. In fact, let's talk about informal hierarchy for just a minute. So this, um, I had a colleague who was looking at uh, primitive tribes in Eastern Sierra Leone uh, near the border of the Gola forest. And he was doing some behavioral economics experiments. And he was trying to understand the relationship between hierarchy and the impact of uh, and the operation of markets. And so he got to this tribe and he thought, okay, how do we create the hierarchy? How do we understand what the hierarchy might look like in this? Is there even a hierarchy? I mean, here's, here's a sort of 
a very primitive um, tribe that doesn't seem to have any elaborated hierarchy by any means. And, and so uh, what they ended up doing, you know, they, they thought, well, we can't, we can't have people fill out surveys and sort of rate one another. And, and so what they ended up doing is they simply asked them to organize themselves in terms of the tribe um, hierarchy. And very quickly, everybody sort of sorted themselves from the most prominent member of the tribe all the way down to the least prominent member of the tribe. And I think that really points to something that we have to acknowledge as we're thinking about less hierarchical organizing is that hierarchical organization is a characteristic of every human and group living non-human society. I mean, the, the idea of a pecking order comes from research on chickens back in the early 1900s. And, and um, if, if you want to look at who's doing more work on hierarchy uh, than, than we are in, in the social sciences, look at the uh, ethologists and people who study animal behavior. And uh, there's, there are very few uh, examples of group living species that aren't hierarchically organized. Um, so why is that? Well, it's, it, it's, it happens because hierarchy is there to resolve key coordination problems. So here's a quote from Melvin Fine, who wrote a book called Human Hierarchies. And he's talking about the evolution of hierarchy and why hierarchy evolved as a, as a solution to coordination problems. And he said, uh, since not everyone can decide where a nomadic band should head when it is time to break camp, someone's opinion needs to dominate. Were this not the case, the group would fragment into factions, nor would a community in which stable patterns of deference are absent have a dependable means of reducing interpersonal conflict. So in other words, hierarchy evolved as a way of helping um, interdependent group living societies to resolve issues like making decisions, resolving disagreements. And this has led some people to conclude, I love this quote, hierarchy is among the recipes for living that have been evolved, tested, and winnowed through hundreds of generations of human social history. On purely scientific grounds, these recipes might be regarded as better tested than the best of psychology speculations on how lives should be lived. In other words, we like to throw out, we like to talk about the post-hierarchical society and the post-bureaucratic society. Well, you know, before doing that, we might ask, stop and, and ask ourselves, why is it that hierarchy has evolved and that you find it so, so broadly represented across all group living species, including our own, for um, uh, a long time, generations of, of human social history. Now, it is true, we have to acknowledge, that people don't love hierarchies, even though they, they sort of, you, you see them everywhere, we don't love them. Uh, we know that it can be stressful and disempowering to occupy a lower hierarchical position. We know that there's a universal motivation to move up within hierarchies. We know that we like to blame hierarchies for stifling change and innovation, but I, I might challenge that one a little bit. And, uh, and then hierarchies violate our democratic instincts in, in the sense that, you know, we we don't want to, we don't, we don't like being in situations where we think some people are better than others. And so if we could get rid of these hierarchies, we certainly would. So let me give you a little, just very briefly, a, a little case study that has, has um, puzzled me for a while. And, and just as an example of, of this tension between on one hand, hierarchies are sort of useful and they play a pretty important role. And on the other hand, we don't really like them and we like to get rid of them and we like to say we don't, we don't like hierarchies. And this, this is a, an iconic example of, of IDEO in the, in the shopping cart. You guys remember this. Uh, NBC Nightline did this thing years ago where they invited IDEO to um, reinvent the shopping cart in five days and then they got the cameras rolling and they're watching this process. And uh, what's really interesting is a, a key theme in that video and something that I think has driven the way a lot of people think about innovation and the process of innovation, a key theme is that you got to get rid of hierarchy. In fact, Dave Kelly, who's the uh, uh, founder of IDEO, uh, here's a quote from that uh, shopping cart video. In a very innovative culture, you can't have a kind of hierarchy of here's the boss and the next person down and the next person down and the next person down. I don't think corporate America wants to hear that right yet. So he's very sort of dismissive of corporate America. He's very dismissive of elaborated hierarchies. And he starts off by saying, if you want to be innovative, you got to get rid of, blow it up, get rid of hierarchy. It's bad. It will, it will kill your innovation project every single time. But then if you watch that, that uh, whole project very, very closely, what you see is it was impossible for them to actually achieve what they wanted to without hierarchy. And at one point, the NBC um, reporter 
kind of confronted Kelly on that and said, well, what, what do you mean? It looks like you, you said there's no hierarchy and yet you're stepping in to, to sort of manage things. And you hear both uh, Kelly and the group facilitator kind of defending this. They're saying, you know, there has to be a command decision. It becomes very autocratic for a short period of time in defining what things people are going to work on. And then Kelly kind of apologizing, kind of laughs and, and says to the reporters, well, we have no choice but to stop that cycle. It's a messy process and could go on forever. So here's this sort of um, ambivalence that we have about, about hierarchy. We're trying to get rid of it. We're trying to, you know, we want less hierarchical organization. We want the post-hierarchical organization, post-bureaucratic. And, and yet, if you really dig in, you can't get rid of it. And, and if we try to get rid of it, what we might end up with is uh, it's a messy process. It's going to go on forever. Um, you, have to, you have to structure there. There's a place. And so this goes back to this idea of, of uh, you know, what is it that leaders do? And, and um, you know, where, where do we find maybe the leader is Gardner, that idea that came up a little bit earlier. So this kind of leads to a couple of questions that I would just end with. Some things that maybe invite us to, to dig a little bit um, further beneath the surface, surface of less hierarchical uh, organizing. First off, when we eliminate formal hierarchy, aren't we simply encouraging the hierarchy to go underground uh, in the form of informal hierarchy? And is that always an improvement? Uh, so for example, let's look at those, Trevor talked about the French cooperatives and how much variability there was across these French cooperatives in terms of how decisions are actually made. Well, I, I suspect that you're gonna find a lot more about how those things actually operate if you can get your arms around the informal hierarchy, even though every single worker has equivalent rights, decision rights in that, in that organization. Um, if you wanna dig beneath the surface of less hierarchical organizing, we've gotta look at the informal hierarchy. Secondly, is hierarchy always a problem? Or maybe it's bad hierarchy that's the problem. This, this uh, kind of harks back to Charles Perrault. I don't know if you remember Charles Perrault, the, the uh, famous sociologist writing about organizations where he said, you know, we like to bash, he was talking specifically about bureaucracy, again, broader concept. But he was saying, you know, we like to talk about bureaucracy as bad. Well, maybe the problem is we're just not applying it appropriately. And, and applying it correctly and in the right places, it actually becomes critical for our ability to manage innovation, to uh, create fair workplaces and, and equitable workplaces. Uh, it reminds me also, you, you remember uh, Adler and Bur Boris's distinction between coercive versus enabling, again, bureaucracy, but I think you could apply the same to hierarchy. And Lindy Greer has been doing some interesting work recently on something she calls hierarchy flexing, which is this idea that you know, hierarchies uh, are, are relevant in some parts of a project and they're not so relevant in other parts of the project. And I think that, that really makes a lot of sense when you look at, for example, IDEO. And finally, what are the alternatives to hierarchy when it comes to coordinating complex human interactions? I think a lot of, um, this, was, this was a question that has come up several times today and has been a theme in many of the papers that we, we looked at. Uh, you look at, obviously, you know, we go back to Uchi, who talked about markets and bureaucracies and clans, um, and Marchetti and Pornam and Lee and Green really kind of, I think, are playing on that concept by looking at the extent to which there's trusting and safe relationships within a group. And when, there, when, when those exist, uh, the, the, the role of hierarchy um, becomes less at least at least becomes less obvious because people are sort of coordinating their their efforts through things like values and, and norms but uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, flexible and emergent networks as an alternative to hierarchy and i think Hila and team's um, research is really kind of speaking to that as well that um, you know if you can get a really well coordinated trusting and cohesive network that's emergent and flexible that could also be an alternative to hierarchy. Although, even there, I would say you're gonna find examples where you need um, people to defer. And that idea of as soon as deference steps in, you've got a hierarchy. And, and so um, we're not gonna ever eliminate it complete, completely. So anyway, those are just some thoughts, maybe some questions to kick off. I know that uh, Mike had hoped that the last few minutes of our, our time together would be um, kind of thinking about these broader questions. So uh, with those questions, I just teed up perhaps or, or others that you have as uh, something to kind of get us thinking. Um, I think we have time now for discussion.
Great. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you. For, you did a great job of teeing up, uh, in addition to obviously some really interesting thoughts and reactions to the, the presentations, uh, teeing up uh, kind of the, the discussion I wanted to end with. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen um, here. Uh, so let's see. Well, you can see that. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, you know, I think what I would love to end with is just to try to get at a broader discussion here around the future of research in this area. And I think Stuart raises some really interesting points around, um, you know, how do we attend to the, um, the, the sort of uh, informal hierarchy when, we, when we're looking at uh, sort of less hierarchical, more like the, the formal structures that, that become less hierarchical. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, you know, I wanted to sort of open this up, uh, but maybe um, I, I would wanted to uh, see if Finish, if you um, might be willing to share some, some thoughts as well, given kind of uh, your, uh, your deep expertise uh, in this area and, and also coming at it from a, a kind of more macro perspective. Uh, I don't mean to, I'm sorry to call you out like this, but uh, would, you, would you be willing to share some, uh, some thoughts? Uh, either in re response to or reaction to the, the presentations, to Stuart's comments, or just uh, uh, sort of any uh, other comments related to these two questions around both uh, what are the sort of important theoretical, most important theoretical questions around uh, related to less hierarchical organizing, and then also you know, around data sets and methodological tools that, um, that would be really useful for, for making uh, advancement in our understanding of, of these new forms of organizing. I'd actually like to get other people's voices in if that's okay. I just want to make sure. a very quick observation, which is that Stuart is exactly right, right? We have very strong evolutionary uh, roots in hierarchies, but the kinds of hierarchies we lived in mostly in our evolutionary uh, selection period versus now are quite different. We're mostly the products of two to three layer prestige hierarchies, but we now live in these multi-layered dominance hierarchies, and those are not that old, right? So effectively outside of church, state, and empire, kind of multi-layered formal authority structures about three to 400 years old. They roughly date from the East India Company, I would say. So it, I think it's to me a completely legitimate question to say, can we do better? Can we retain some of the tendency and taste we have for prestige-based hierarchy and get rid of these monsters we've created? Great, thank you, Finish. Um, so I'm gonna open it up. Uh, and uh, you can either uh, note in the, the chat or if you want to just unmute yourself, uh, um, feel free to do that. Otherwise, I may call on people. It looks like Paul raised his hand. OK. Yeah. I know that wasn't one of your options, Mike, but I'm just expanding. Yeah, yeah. Just Baseball. expanding the choice set a bit. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't. I am not even paying attention to the raised hand. So, so <laughs> thank you, Trevor, for, for pointing that out. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Just one quick thought. So Stuart's um, closing comments were intriguing that this notion that um, hierarchy has been around for a very long time at some level, it seems very deeply ingrained. Maybe it's even adaptive to some level. Um, but I think if you look at a lot of the self-management context and was watching some of the chat, it seems like when we, we tend to talk about these organizations as non-hierarchical, but maybe it's different hierarchical. I was reflecting on the anecdote that Stuart led with that we went into a group and they're trying to figure out how do we get a sense of what the hierarchy is and they just asked them to organize themselves. I think if you walked into many non-traditional or non-typically organized, hierarchically organized organizations or firms and asked them that sort of question, you might get a response like, okay, we can do that, but it depends on the context. What's the specific question or what's the set of circumstances we're talking about? And the hierarchy would vary pretty wildly as a function of that. Um, and I think that's one of, I, to, to me, that maybe is a, a better way of thinking about this form of organization than non-hierarchical. That's one. Number two, um, there's this some, something a sort of a side question here, and I'm, this is not an observation as much as something that's occurred to me in this last part of the conversation. Um, formal hierarchy carries with it one um, like benefit in the sense that we all know what the hierarchy is. It's very formal and written down and everyone sort of understands it. When we're talking about 
informal or more dynamic or fluid forms of hierarchy, there's opportunities for people to have misperceptions or gaps in their sense of what the hierarchy looks like. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and I'm not sure that relates to the broader conversation. So I guess it's sort of two thoughts or comments. Yeah, and I'll just quickly, I mean, I think just on the point around non-hierarchical, you know, I mean, I think that I, I use, I think we use the term less hierarchical uh, in, in the name of this uh, symposium very deliberately and intentionally. Um, you know, I think that claiming kind of the absence of hierarchy is, 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 is going too far. And I think to, to a lot of students' points, like it's impossible uh, to get rid of informal hierarchy and even formal hierarchies for, for sort of, Abs you know, outside of maybe employee owned worker cooperatives, even, you know, um, you know, cases of holacracy or valve and sort of privately owned firms are, you know, many scholars have made the point are inherently hierarchical um, legally, you know, that, that, that all decision rights are ultimately held by, by the owners and by those at the top. So, um, so I think there's an important sort of, you know, maybe, maybe less, even less hierarchical is, is not the right right term conceptually, but I think that, you know, we make a very clear uh, sort of distinction and point about not using the term non-hierarchical. So Mike, should we just chime in if we have? Yes, yes. Um, then you asked about the important theoretical questions that we don't know maybe or, or did not answer. So I think uh, in these times of resilience crisis one of the questions is or one of the assumptions was i think that hierarchy is stable right it's good for could stand in crisis or good for resilience and i think that's an assumption that is now worth investigating both on the hierarchical very hierarchical organization and those that are not i'm trying to look at open source uh, after i've studied wikipedia to see how for instance the covid crisis has impact the stability of projects the contribution of people but i'm curious if people have any inclinations or thoughts or hunches around stability resilience uh, and hierarchy in regular organization or not so that's interesting. george i saw, I saw you uh unmuted do you want to chime in here can i follow up on that then yes please um so, so so I think we need a, we need a kind of a, a more general, more generic uh, notion of hierarchy. I've adopted Herb Simon's uh, notion of hierarchy, which basically is uh, is a sequence of abstraction levels, possibly translated in accountability uh, uh, levels. Um, something you also find in Elliot Chuck's uh, work very strongly. This is the kind of definition that embraces both informal and formal hierarchy but it also embraces uh, other kinds of hierarchy, notion of hierarchy, for example, developed by software engineers in terms of the hierarchies uh, that I use in, in terms of writing a software code. Um, and the hierarchy you find in, 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 in the internet, for example, eh, where there's a strong hierarchy in terms of URL levels. Um, so I, I'm, I've been using uh, Simon's notion of hierarchy, which is kind of uh, more universal and, uh, and and if you look at it from that perspective, you indeed find uh, enormous constancy in, in hierarchies uh, throughout any kind of biological or social system, uh, um, uh, uh, so which reinforces the point that uh, had been made earlier, that you find hierarchies uh, everywhere once you uh, uh, start defining it a bit more broadly than only in terms of uh, responsibility and authority. May I jump in, please? Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, last session we presented Philip Trutcher and myself uh, the particle physics community at uh, Geneva, Atlas CERN. Uh, there are 3,000 scientists. And um, if you have interacted with scientists and we are all kind of academics, uh, we go on expertise. And uh, if you think about the Higgs boson particle and the physicists, uh, high energy physicists, uh, scientists, they cannot be a, a, a kind of a controlling neuron, um, which decides, you know, that this is a valid uh, finding or not. So it's kind of very complicated. Of course, you know, it, the whole thing depends upon what we mean by hierarchy. But if you want to think about an organization or organizations which are less hierarchical, 
uh, I would recommend study scientists because they have to remove uh, politics. Uh, they have to remove uh, fiat um, and power. Um, and they have to remove, in this particular instance, Hila, to your question, uh, these were open contracts, uh, letters of intent. Uh, th these were all voluntary people. These are all open source. Uh, the scientists could leave anytime they wanted to, uh, but yet they had to find a consensus. Any case, uh, I just thought, uh, I also want to say that a uh, group of uh, excellent presentations today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Raghu, for that suggestion around studying scientists uh, as kind of an interesting maybe field site or, or kind of research setting um, to study these dynamics. Could I, uh, could I jump in? Yeah. Trevor, and then uh, Fritjof, I know I see your hand is raised, so I'm, I just want you to know that you, you, you're next. One, one comment that I'd have is that I, I, I think in talking about hierarchy, it's important to be able to operationally define it and talk about whether hierarchy is helpful or not. And it was just mentioned, but there is research going back about 50 years. Elliot Jacks originally developed it, talking about stratification of organizations. And the idea is that part of the reason of hierarchy is that people have different levels of capability. And that level of capability can be measured and the complexity of work can be measured. And one of the things, we've, we've got a database now of over 70,000 manager direct report relationships. And one of the things we found is that uh, while better design is related to better performance, one of the keys is the manager direct report relationship. And a manager should be exactly one stratum above a direct report in terms of capability and the level of work done. And we found that it's only correct about half the time. And most of the time it's compressed where the manager is going to be micromanaging. So in a lot of satisfaction surveys, manager relationship with the manager is critical. Our view would be that if you don't get that alignment right between the manager and direct report, by definition, you're going to have a suboptimal relationship. So I think it's useful to talk about not just hierarchy as, as levels, but whether they're set up in a way that lead to better outcomes or not. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's very, very interesting, uh, looking at the, the kind of manager-subordinate relationship in addition to kind of more of a structural perspective. Um, yeah, Trevor, I think you were, uh, you had a comment? Uh, so I just want to make two quick comments. One is that, um, you know, I, the paper that you, Mike, wrote with Amy Edmondson, the review paper, uh, was incredibly helpful. And um, I haven't seen another sort of effort to synthesize and integrate this vast literature. I mean, we're all drawing on somewhat distinct literatures and beginning to bring, right, these different categories of less hierarchical organizations into the same conversation is, is really helpful. Um, the, the second comment is, is related to, to Stuart's um, point, you know, thinking about sort of hierarchy as these nested layers of authority. Um, and in a lot of these, what we're calling less hierarchical organization, it's not that there is no, um, you know, uh, superordination and subordination. It's just that, like, I'm in charge I have authority on some issues and Mike has authority on some issues and sometimes Mike is my boss and sometimes I'm Mike's boss. Um, and so it's not that there's no hierarchy, it's, it's just that sort of the, the hierarchy is more broken into pieces and it's not nested in that traditional way. So I think sort of re the first point, like having a more careful synthesis and categorization of these different types I think would be a helpful sort of step forward. Yeah, it's making me think there is sort of an opportunity for, you know, an, a kind of another a piece that really, you know, especially because the perspectives really vary across like levels. So for like micro, meso and macro scholars, um, you know, they're draw you know, we're drawing on different, uh, different citations and different, uh, different conceptions of hierarchy. And, uh, you know, I know Stuart, uh, you know, it has a great piece out, uh, but that's really looking kind of more at the kind of micro teams uh, operationalization of hierarchy and the different ways that's operationalized. And I think there might be an opportunity to what your to your point, Trevor, for like a cross level um, uh, sort of a synthesis of different these different conceptions. 
Um, so we have a couple more minutes. So uh, uh, Fritjof, uh, uh, you've had your hand raised for a, a little while, so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So maybe I should say first that I, uh, it's the first time that I'm joining here. So I uh, am very new to all of this. Um, uh, and I'm actually a, a scholar myself also, but I'm uh, at a design uh, faculty at uh, Delft University of Technology. And so what I sometimes notice is a bit is like that, uh, that the, the, the research around design has moved on from, from a lot of things, especially in that sense from, uh, from Simon. And what I would be really curious about is to understand more the process of, so to say, less hierarchical organizing uh, emerging in an organization, kind of like the learning process that goes with that, uh, also the, the, the cultural aspects that, that go with that, because I would expect that um, a lot of things that people have learned somewhere else need to be kind of like unlearned almost from, from so to say, what works somewhere else to here. And realizing that like even the way that people are like treated in, in school already builds this hierarchy kind of like in their head. So that, that if we want less hierarchical or, or different hierarchical ways of organizing, that we maybe also have to think about how we can we do a less hierarchical or different hierarchical uh, education. I mean, down to, to how we teach in university, we are still uh, all too often, uh, uh, the, the teacher has always the right answer and the student could never be the one that uh, can tell the teacher, yeah, sorry, but your answer is actually not the right one. So I'm really curious about this process. Yeah, and I think that that, uh, thank you for that, for Chaff, and I think, uh, you know, that really struck me too and, and some of the comments during, uh, during Paul and I's research presentation, I think spoke to that, that question of how do we, how do we train people to sort of adapt in these new environments? Um, so, so uh, we're at time now, and I want to be really respectful. But I, I you know, I wanted to thank all of the presenters, uh, to Stuart uh, for for taking the time to really synthesize all of this and share his perspectives, and yes. also to uh, Phoenician and Rishika, who um, you know helped put this on uh, through the org design community. I want to really encourage people to check check that out. Uh, join the community. There are lots of really interesting events uh, and so I think it really is probably the only and the best sort of con community and container for people from all of these varying perspectives but who have an interest in these topics to really connect and to try to sort of synthesize um, sort of our different perspectives. Um, so uh, so yeah, thank you very much and uh, Finish, this will be recorded, right? And will be made available? Yes, indeed, it will. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for hosting a wonderful event. Thanks, Richard, as well.